And the question is, is, you know, are you the cause of what's happening in your life? Or are you just the bouncing off of other energies that are influencing you to do this or that? That's a big thing too that resonates with me right now. Of like, I want to be the cause. And to be the cause, you got to have vision. You got to have goals. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts. This is the Converse Cowboy, brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. Cass Haley, glad to have you on the show, my friend. Um, Cass, for those of you guys who don't know, um, Cass is a husband, a father, singer, songwriter, six albums out, was a runner up on America's Got Talent in 2007, nominated for Best Reggae Rock Entertainer in 2013 for the International Reggae and World Music Awards. And in 2020, Cass was the grand prize winner of Lincoln Motor Company's Chart Your Course contest with his winning song, Every Road I'm On, which is on his latest album, All the Right People. And uh, Cass, we're damn sure going to get into that and, and a lot more. But uh, before we do, man, how's life treating you? It's pretty good, man. You know, we, uh, we just got back from a little run where we were sort of testing the sort of the waters on the road. This is the first time that we've been able to tour in the last year so we were just doing like a little two-week run and all socially distant shows and so it was really things are feeling like the, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel and being out on the road and playing shows was really cool and yeah. so you know it's springtime as well so we're getting the garden ready and all kinds of projects here on our farm and stuff so it really it feels really good right now right on man that is, it's, it's encouraging, you know, other musicians that I've sat down with, they're getting back out and playing and touring around. So I'm excited to, um, to get out and see some of those shows. Um, but Paris, Texas, Paris, Texas native, um, we have a mutual friend, Mr. Bubba Bell. And uh, yeah. I reached out to Bubba. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm preparing for this interview with Cass. You know, what you got for me? And he pulled out some dirt, man. He pulled out oh, no. stuff, <laughs> I've got some dirt on him, too. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, I thought it was interesting, mind. you know, and um, I thought it was cool um, because I think it's important to go back in order to understand how you got where you are today, you know. And um, one of the first things he said, and it, and, and it kind of surprised me, he's like, man, Cass could throw some hands back in back in the junior high days and the high school ah, days, you know. I was like, that's so funny. Cass, a fighter? What? Until I got my ass whipped. <laughs> and then then when, when I was on the receiving end, I, I, uh, I really understood how it feels. <laughs> and I stopped doing that. Yet, my dad had a reputation for being a badass locally. And so like when I was a kid, I would grow up hearing that. And then my dad... You know, one of the things that he taught me, he was like, Cass, always avoid a fight. Always. If you can avoid it, avoid it. But don't ever get hit first. <laughs> He's like, if you get to the point where you don't think you can avoid it, strike first. And you're you're bound to win. And that worked like for years, <laughs> you know, for, for, for two or three years. And I really thought I was tough. And, you know, I, I, I really did feel like I was always on the right side of the fight whether it was for standing up for somebody or or you know that's totally my ego thinking i was on the right side <laughs> of the fight because i'm sure there's people out there that are like you know don't feel that way but you know um after what i realized is after i got my ass kicked excuse my language i hope this I hope I no curse cursing is fine you're, you're okay. more than fine. um after i got after i got you know my butt whooped then i realized 
like the kind of energy exchange that happens when you when a man feels defeated and it, it leaves this it leaves this sort of peace where you're always looking over your shoulder and it's almost like a notch in your belt for that person you're creating this and a lot of times it's hard to get past this sort of like you know when you see that person in public even 20 years later if that dude kicked your ass in middle school or in high school you still don't like him <laughs> and, 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 and you don't trust, you know, you don't trust the situation. And it's like, it just cuts that in. I realized how severe the potential is to cut the energy off between people. It can also make people closer because it's such an intimate thing, vital, right. you know, but I just realized real quick that I didn't want to be, I didn't want a bunch of people running around, you know, not, uh, that we're sort of enemies. You know what I mean? Right. I don't want enemies. I can't yeah. believe Bubba told you that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way, man. The dude that I know and I met, uh, I was like, there's no way he was a fighter at any time, you know? Well, man, but, you know, it's one of those things where I'm, uh, it's, I'm definitely type A and a little more on the aggressive side. And I've tried to cultivate, um, try to cultivate the opposite of that because I've, you know, been so aggressive and, and had a temper in my day. And it's, it's yeah. been a, a, a big teacher of mine, you know what I mean? To learn how to not punch holes in the wall or to go get into a fight, you know, to, to, to be a better person. I know there's a lot of us out there that do that and that, that have that anger. And I'm definitely one of those that, that deal with that. And it's, you know, being a father has been probably the best lesson because I have these sets of eyes looking at me mm -hmm. that reveal immediately how ridiculous I'm acting. <laughs> like, you know, whether it's like, I'll be out, you know, fixing a fence and get angry at like some, something getting stuck and, you know, I'll, I'll blow up and cuss. And my son's just looking over at me. Like he's my grandpa just being like, <laughs> Cass, you know, it's <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's a journey, man. You know, the, the very, I think that, you know, my anger and my temper at the same time is the, is also the energy that I use to, to keep pushing forward through, you know, life in general. So it's, it, yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's just a bad thing. I think it just has to be channeled properly, you know, and that's what I've been trying to do. It's hard, yeah. But. No, that's well said. That's definitely well said. Tell me this, like, um, how does that translate into your music? I know, like, er at an early age, what I read, you, you picked up your first guitar at the age of eight, came from a music family. You all would have uh, uh, band practice there in your kitchen, right, whenever you are growing up. So music yeah. was all around you from an early age, it seems like. Yeah, for sure, man. My parents were both musicians. My dad always had, you know, my dad... Uh, his passion was performing music and playing music. He wasn't, he wasn't really a songwriter. He was, he was more of a blues musician and standards and stuff like that. But he always had, he always had some plan of, of being able to break away from the daily grind and just play music, you know, and he, he sacrificed a lot to not do that with me and my four sisters. There's five of those kids, you know, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of un sort of like unseen dreams in his life, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. um, that was a huge part of, you know, my childhood too, is because I could tell he was always sort of halfway going after it, but he would never really take the leap fully. But, and, and I think that's one of the, the amazing things that my parents did for me is since they, they were very well like acquainted with, how tough it was to be in the music business um, and to be able to take the leap and to be able to have children. I mean, I grew up where one of the things that I heard around the house that probably came from my dad and a few other of the musicians that had children and then sort of halfway blamed having children on the reason they didn't uh, complete their dreams. At the same time, they were teenagers of the sixties and they were definitely addicted to the party aspect of music as well. <laughs> so, you know, there's, it's more complex than just children, but that still was a big thing. Uh -huh. I remember growing up here and once you have kids, your chances of having a career are over. And I, 
I remember hearing that over and over. And that was a fear of mine growing up. Mm -hmm. But one of the other things, one of the blessings that they gave me was they totally, they never, that was probably the most negative thing, the most like that, that, that they sort of instilled of like, you know, you need to watch out the responsibilities you take on and having children is such a huge one that you might not, it's going to take so many sacrifices that that might be one that you're not willing to sacrifice. Uh -huh. Um, you know, because music's going to take you down these roads that that's not going to be a balanced situation. You're not going to be able to be at home. And so, you know, that was a really a big part of my psyche. Um, another big part of it was they did give me, you know, they gave me the belief that it was actually possible, you know? So like, and that's a huge thing. Like mm -hmm. they really never one time ever said this is not practical, you know, pursuing this career. They were like, man, you can do whatever you want to do. And this is something that is, is if you love it, you know, they started me on the journey of following my bliss of like listening to the voice, you know, that uh -huh. tells me like the direction to go. Um, they really set the foundation um, that, that made all this possible because that's the, that's the thing that I see with a lot of other young artists and songwriters and people that are trying to do it in general is that, man, the world tells us we got to do certain things especially America too. Like, you know, you yeah. got to have your job. You got to do this. You need to be taking care of business. You probably want a green grass. You want green grass as well. You want that manicured lawn. You want a nice car. Um, you know, yeah. all these things. All that, the social you know, conditioning. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. The that's loops, and, young, and, young. and that gets in the way of so many of us being able to feel successful, mm -hmm. you know, like feel happy and, 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 feeling happy and being success in, in my eyes from a man's perspective. And I'm sure it's from a woman. I'm sure this goes both ways, but as a man being his own boss, you know what I mean? To me, that's like success. It's freedom. Me right? getting to me getting to have vision and have goals and set out on projects and do my thing, whether it's touring, whether it's gardening, you know, raising pigs or whatever, like all of those are just like things that I wanted to do. And yeah. I, and you go and, you know, when you have that, that gift and blessing that my parents gave me of like confidence in creativity and creation and, and an open plan field, like I, you know, I wasn't raised religious or anything, but yet spirituality was a part. So there wasn't, I was raised in sort of an open way that right. I think really has uh, helped me helped me be just, you know, a happier person or at least in pursuit of that. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. No, I love it, dude. I love it. And, and me and Andy the guy behind the camera, we were having a very similar conversation before we started this, you know, and it's like, and I've talked about it before, just the social conditioning of just what you said, go to school, get a good job that pays good money. And then before we know it, we're fucking handcuffed to this job because we're attached to this money. We're attached to this lifestyle, you know, and, and what we really want to do, what we love to do kind of takes a back seat. And when you zoom out and look at it, you're like, what the fuck happened? You're 35, 40 years old. And you're looking back like, man, what did, where did I go wrong? You know? Yeah. Where, and, and where, where is my presence? at like where why you know it's that's the the real tragedy of living a life that the rules are defined by other people and and like and the conditioning that we're talking about the real tragedy is it, that it takes presence from you it takes you being able to like feel your life mm -hmm. you know being able to be here versus thinking of like oh man living for the weekend you know what i mean exactly, i don't yeah. want to live for the weekend <laughs> i don't i don't want to live for quality time. I want to live for taking the trash out of castrating these piglets that we just did in the morning. The <laughs> stuff, the gritty stuff and the stuff that, that are my vision and my own goals, my own agreements with myself, you know, it's sort of just, you know, crafting, crafting your life experience, man. I'm a big, I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and, and he, he really, when I started getting into Joseph Campbell, it's sort of, you know, really brought a lot of things together with, of like how important it is 
that if you know what you want to do in any given situation, it's so important that you do it. Like, you know, there's so many different little justifications of like, oh, well, I really don't want to do that, but I'm going to, I'm going to go with this just because I don't, I want to avoid a conflict or um, it's usually some kind of fear thing. You're usually afraid of, of going against the grain or, or the outside sort of things, you know, and, and uh, the older I get, the more and more the same lesson just keeps getting pounded. Like Cass, you've got a perspective, you have an opinion and you need to apply that to your life and you need to pivot and you need to, you know, refine your approach in every situation and if you know, if you're lucky enough to know which direction you want to go, go. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Man, there's a couple of questions that come to mind. Like, I feel like we all have intuition. There's something guiding us. There's some higher power, um, whatever you want to label it or call it. Go ahead. Yeah, but how do you know, like, how do you trust that intuition, Cass, versus like that other voice, that other like negative chatter that may be trying to lead us, lead us astray? You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, which it could be, it could very well be the fear and the resistance. You know, how do you try yeah, to think, distinguish I think between you the gotta, two? You know, I think it's through, I think it's through experimenting. You know, I think, I think you, I think you got to take a, what I try to do is like, you know, once every two or three months is sort of go back and look at what I did and just sort of reflect on the decisions that I made, the people that, the just, and that goes down to everything from who you're around, who you're in business with, the decisions that you made about the way that you're, you know, especially like being on the road. Um, you know, if I was just like, I'm trying to cultivate um, a good experience for me and my family on the road. So there's all kinds of variables that come into that. If I was just to, to call some random agent and say, I want to go out on a tour, you know, I'm liable to be playing in rock clubs with pictures of all kinds of horrible shit in the green room, you know, <laughs> show starting at 11 o'clock, you know, uh, people being drunk out of their minds. Like there's so many different ways that could go. And, and usually that would probably, you know, uh, go in a direction that wasn't really balanced and wasn't really something good for me. So I think it comes down to like, you know, it comes down to, to, to having vision of saying, okay, I want to experience this. And then, you know, thinking about and designing that experience down to what you can at least like con conceive and at least project of like, okay, these are the things that I want to experience. And then you go out and do that. And then you, at the end of it, you take a look back and you say, you know what, this, 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 and this didn't work for me. And you just keep on changing, you keep on refining. And um, it is really tricky to define where fear is in your life. Mm -hmm. Because it, 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 for me, you know, I've been pursuing music um, wholeheartedly is what I've been telling myself since I was, you know, 12 or 13 years old. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And I've sort of, I feel like I've been on the same path move in a direction, but several times I've gotten sidetracked and I thought I was still moving forward, but I was moving a different direction. And usually it, it's fear. Something comes in and, and in this particular situation that I'm talking about, it was like saying no to opportunities. I was so afraid that another opportunity wouldn't come that I would just say yes to every opportunity. Yeah. And um, I got myself in all kinds of situations that energetically just weren't inspiring to me. And they were actually, and it was because of that sort of like, you know, it was fear behind that decision. So like, you got to ask yourself and you've got to really reflect on it and spend some time with decisions that you're making and do these dis decisions inspire you, you know, and if the decisions don't inspire you, then you, you probably shouldn't make them, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that's the way that I go about everything is like, take a really good, good look, you know, and, and, you know, it, it, and see if they inspire you or not. Cause nope. it's a tough thing when something like, okay, this is inspiring, but it's also super scary because I'm going to have to spend all this money. I'm going to have to risk this, you know? And yeah. so like inspiration, or are you going to say, you know, 
just isn't worth it because I don't want to take the risk. Usually the safe route is not the way. Yeah. Yeah. The way is typically through the resistance and through the fears. And I love what you said. You know, it's a constant retuning. It's a constant, you know, for me, it's just staying curious, you know, because where I am now and where I was three months ago, I'm in a different place. And I know three months, six months from now, it's going to be another recalibration or another retuning, you know. And, and uh, the question is, is are you the cause or are you just, you know, being affected by other people? people being affected by, you know, are you the cause of what's happening in your life? Or are you just the bouncing off of other energies that are influencing you to do this or that? That's yeah. a big thing too, that resonates with me right now. Of like, I want to be the cause and to be right. the cause, you got to have vision. You got to have and goals. Yeah. For me, it comes back to what is my intention? You know, like yeah. what are my intentions for what I'm doing right now? You know? Yeah. Um, uh, you had quite a few quotes and, and you just said something that reminded me of one and um, you said, it's hard to recognize what your fears are. Fear is one of those things that hides in weird places. Yeah. It's hard to see sometimes, you know? Super hard because yeah. it, can be, it can be cloaked up in, in your passion. It can be like you can be on this path moving forward of like thinking you're on your journey, but doing it in a fearful way and yeah. attract all of those things sort of to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's tricky. It's tricky. But I think like what we were talking about is refining of like, and having someone, you know, me having Cassie and the kids to help. It's not just about what's good for me. This is like a total sort of Jordan Peterson kind of thing of like, how do you make good decisions? A good decision is what's good for the most people around you. Mm. Like, so, and that's, that's also a tricky thing of like, how do you follow your bliss? And then at the same time, balance your goals and your vision in a way that is sort of feeding your soul, but at the same time is holistically best for mom, for dad, for brother, for sister, for everybody that's involved, Right. you know, and usually you find a place that what, what's really truly good for you, you know, it, it, it it ends up being good for everybody, but it's tricky, you know, it's just, especially in regards to time. Right. But it seems like you've done a very good job of that cast and kind of uh, counterintuitive to the advice you got from a young age. Like you are incorporating your kids, your family into your music. And, and like I, I, we saw you at a show in Dallas and the whole family was up on stage singing and yeah. just having a good time. So it seems like you have found the balance. Well, I'm trying, it's still a, it's a constant sort of like tweaking it because I also don't want to be forcing the kids on stage. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, get on stage. <laughs> you know? I mean, and it's one of those things where, you know, I want them to enjoy it. And this last tour, Evan played bass the entire tour. Yeah. Nola's playing fiddle on a couple songs and, you know, Cassie, we're, we're trying to pursue this in a fun, holistic way. And I don't want to take it too seriously either. So I want it to be, I want it to be fun and balanced. And that's a, a challenging thing for me because I, I have the tendency to get hyper-focused and to get narrow focused and to lose the open. And so that's what I've, you know, been trying to cultivate in myself of just like continually asking myself, you know, cause the, the hyper-focus is a superpower. You know, that's how I developed the ability to play and to sing is I was in my bubble and I would spend so much time just doing it. Um, but now, you know, as I get older, I realize the limitations of that. So, you know, I just. But it's a um, balance though, right? It's like, that is what, what propels you forward and everybody in life, that's part of what propels you forward. But at some point, when does that become counterproductive? And I think for everybody, that may be a different answer. Yeah. It's like everybody, yeah, you, everybody, we, we've got to continually check in with each other on an energetic level as far as our family of like, are we all experiencing this good? You know? That's um, awesome, man. You know, so it, it's tough. It's just like we just recently realized that we've got to have a merch guy with us. Cassie does, you know, Cassie running merch was a cool idea at first, but then when we tried it, then we have my daughter that is 12 years old or working on 12 years old. She's 11 who 
really needs a companion at these shows where she's not just backstage by herself. You know what I mean? So it's like, so we've, you know, we figured out that having a merch guy just makes the experience for my life so much easier, you know, when we were trying and that's a little, little more expensive, but we're, but it makes everything work so much better. Um, yeah. We just got rid of our camper, which we were torn in. We right tore in five, five years. We had that camper and it was a good idea at first and it saved us a lot of money you know, but it was a lot of work too, because I'm the driver, I'm the maintenance man, <laughs> I'm the tour manager. I'm, you know, and it's so, it's, it's like, um, it's, we got rid of that and now we're doing hotels again. So, oh, hell it's, yeah. uh, so that, that feels good as well. So it's, it's just about checking in on a regular level and, and recognizing when it's time to change, right. Like, and being willing to, to change. I think that's yeah. hard for me. It was anyway, like, Oh yeah, we get, we get comfortable, you know. We get comfortable in our bubble, and this is how it is, and this is what we know. And it's like I don't think it's like the fear of the unknown. It's like the fear of leaving what we know. Yeah, and it, it come. It's it's you know it's those hardwired networks. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean that's yeah. that's what it is. It's like I'm a big fan of um you know changing the furniture around in our house or change in which side of the bed we sleep on. And at yeah. first it's weird. And our brain tells us like, no, don't do yeah. this. Or sitting in a different chair in the morning for my coffee, looking at the house from a different area. I think that's super healthy, uh -huh. you know, logically for your, for our brain. Um, and I'm super into it. And I feel the differences of, of, I think changing it up, changing it up, changing it up as yeah. much as you possibly can is the healthy way. Yeah, I agree. I do the same thing. I'll, I'll, take a different route to work, you know, just to, to change up the routine. Yeah, man. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about that. I don't know if you follow him. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. I love him. He's I mean, great, man. I went to one of his, uh, seminars down in Columbia and, uh, Hey, I mean, it was life changing stuff, you know, I mean, just from reading his books and then seeing him live, it's, uh, he, he's doing a lot of cool things right now. Man. I love him too, because, it's all real practical sort of science stuff. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's no, that's all good. Um, yeah, man, I really love him because it sort of takes, like I'm into all kinds of stuff, but I love his ability to explain it, you know, on a really practical scientific level of like, this isn't the woo woo, you yeah. know, the gray yeah. area. This is like some real like mechanics going on here. Right. of how we experience things and the way that the brain works and stuff. And for me, although I'm attracted to the mystical, you know, and the, and the super sensible, if you will, I love the sensible as well. And I think that they're one sort of one and the same and don't need to be separated too much. You know, I think that's, that's a, a, a big problem in a lot of people's lives is they live in these half truth kind of mindsets. Right. You know, it's right. either a real spiritual experience or just a horrible one, a horrible <laughs> yeah. physical experience, you know? And I believe that this very moment is as spiritual as it's ever going to get and as physical as it's ever going to get. I don't believe yeah. they're separate things. I like the whole non-dual duality kind of approach, you know? Yeah. I think it, it was his quote. He says, you have to be able to keep one foot in the quantum field and then one foot in the physical reality, you know? And he's right. I mean, I, I would tend to get like, too woo woo or too one way or two in the physical but really when you can balance that out at least for me like this is just my experience i found like that is whenever i'm hitting on all cylinders you know yeah well and you're actually experiencing more of a truth whereas like you know temperature like a cold and hot are two different polarities and measurements of one thing it's mm -hmm. temperature and i think that that's the way with super sensible and sensible like the internal and the external, you know what I mean? I think that, you know, to be able to see the whole truth, you have to see the polarity of any given thing. Yeah. And they're actually one thing. Yeah. You know? Right. And that helps, that helps sort of bringing it back together. Yeah. You know, you know and I, it's like, well, we'll get, well, I'll dive off onto this little venture here, but like, I didn't, my, my awareness got expanded once I started diving into some plant medicines and some psilocybin and stuff like that, because we are so limited as human beings, we have five senses. And so we're limited to, limited to what is actually going on, you know, to the vibrations that are around us. 
but nobody yeah. ever, you can't see it. And so a lot of people just think it's not real or that it's woo woo. My we get question to our story, we get locked into the narrative. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so it's all around us. And I, I question like, well, how does your radio work? How does your internet work? You don't question those wavelengths that are going through and making Google pop up, you know, but it's all real, you know, and, uh, I want to know your thoughts on like practices, things you do to continue to expand your awareness. Yeah, man. Well, I think, you know, I think the healthiest and first thing that comes to mind is meditation. Mm. Of, you know, of taking the time to just sit and breathe and just clear it out. You know, it's like um, I started meditating about 15 years ago and I was coming out of a long period of my life where I was abusing drugs. Um, you know, like I don't consider psilocybin and, uh, you know, even LSD. I don't consider those, I don't consider those drugs. Right. I, I agree. I it's set and setting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, I, th I consider those medicines on a, on a, I'm very pro like the, all the new technology that all, all, all of the new advancements that's happening with psilocybin and stuff. But I think for me to eat, like as a kid, I experimented in a party setting, but I'm super thankful, um, for those experiences, but going back to meditation, we'll get into the, the, the psychedelics here in a minute. Talk, talk specifically though, Cass, cause I've, I've talked about meditation before, but I think for a lot of listeners, it may be good to talk about specific meditation practices that you do. Cause yep. some people think, you know how it is. Like when you first oh, yeah. hear meditation, you're like, Oh no, I can't do that. Yeah, exactly. Or I can't sit still for more than for a minute. Me, for me, meditation started in a super dark place. I was partying on the weekends. I was staying up for multiple nights. I was drinking. I was eating horrible. I was in a band called Woodbelly and we were, you know, we were doing really well down in Deep Ellum and we were playing. Uh, you know, we had just started to tour. Um, and then my wife got pregnant. Okay, smack. My dad's words come back to me. Your career's over, Cass. <laughs> you yeah, know yeah, yeah. I mean? it was like the one thing that he warned me about here i was here i was in a whole and and in all reality my, my career was headed it probably had peaked out at that point just because of my behaviors you know what i mean the partying yeah. and stuff like that but here i was sort of in this dark place um my wife got pregnant and i had this thing of like okay even when i was in a dark place I would, I've never would have considered myself a drug addict or anything. I always had a pretty good foundation in that, man, this, this stuff was fun, but every time I do any kind of thing, even drinking, it's like, I have to trade in three days for one. Yeah. So it's like, if I went on a two week binger, man, it was going to be like two months before, like I felt like normal again, but I always had that kind of awareness where I would, I, I wouldn't go on long binges with drinking or any of those other things. So like for me, I was sitting there, my wife was pregnant. I had pretty much said, man, I'm getting sober. I'm not, not gonna drink anymore. And I'm flipping through the channels and on PBS, this program pops up. The Power of Intention, mm. Dr. Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer. And dude, this program was the beginning of so many blessings in my life so many like empowering kind of perspectives um i don't know if you've ever read the power of intention by wayne dyer i have and i followed some of his stuff um but i have um, not read it's, that book. it's a great intro for the westerner I'm gonna you know write it down. it's a great intro if you're interested in taking control of your life and your happiness and your awareness and you know, it's a, it was, it was the intro for meditation for me through Wayne Dyer's book, getting in the gap. Um, so 15 years ago, I started, I'm um, doing this, what he called, it's more of a transcendental type meditation where you would chant and, um, and I got into it, um, pretty heavily and, and it, it started changing my life. Um, it helped, you know, with, with everything. It helped with my anger. It helped with me, 
a being able to stay away from substances and drinking and just like, um, and at the same time, I'm having this child and I feel like, you know, I was, I remember when my son was born, I thought I knew what love was and I thought I knew what God was, but I knew the minute I saw him that I had no idea <laughs> that it was like love was defined in that moment of like the, a natural love too, not a story of love, not care about someone else, but this like natural, just cosmic kind of thing of life mm. and my connection to it and my responsibility for it. It was so powerful, bro. Mm -hmm. um, so that led me on the journey and it's been up and down. I haven't constantly meditated for 15 years. I go through, um, I go through stints where I'll meditate for a few months and then I won't meditate, you know, and then I'll try some different stuff. You know, I've experimented with more of, um, I really enjoy transcendental meditation because of the musician in me and the ability that chanting has to get you in a, a kind of zone and sort of hypnotize and getting into a trance with yourself. And then the gaps between your, for me, the gaps between my chants I would be able to sit in those a little bit longer in a, in a, in a little bit um, less noisy environment. Mm -hmm. And the way that the way that Wayne Dyer teaches or in this book taught about meditation was like thoughts are like these waves of the ocean and they never stop. Right. You know what I mean? Like when you're meditating, the point's not to have to stop your thoughts. That's the first thing that a lot of people say. They're like, Oh, I, I can't stop thinking, you know, I, I can't meditate. I was like, actually, Meditation is just not letting that wave carry you away. Or when you do notice that it's carrying you away, you hop off and you, you recognize the thought and you just sit there and you just recognize the thoughts and you get, you get a sense and you get an awareness of what you're thinking, that's you know, it. and it can go so many different directions from there, but that's a good way to start. And even five minutes of just breathing, chanting, and just watching your thoughts pass by is, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, it does make you feel good. The minute I'm in it and the minute and right after it, I feel great, but it's also, it changes the way that I'm able to see my own behavior throughout the day. Exactly. Yeah. Changes my awareness of, I catch myself in that temper tantrum when I'm flipping out at the fence post and yeah. I'm banging it with the hammer, <laughs> you know, and my son, I catch myself. Verse and, and, and I still have a temper and I still have these moments of rage, you know, use, but they're, they're getting smaller and smaller before well, the I difference recognize. Is, yeah, I would think, and I don't mean to interrupt, but like you catch those thoughts, you become less reactive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. And it's, um, so, you know, that's where it began for me. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it, it's been, it's been a really positive thing. And as I've gotten older, and, you know, for a year, for probably five or six years, that was the main type of meditation that I did. And then um, I've started experimenting with more of an open focus meditation of just an awareness of my surroundings, sort of checking in with your body, um, you know, being aware of just like um, how your body feels and sort of doing a, more, a scan of your entire body as you're sitting there and a scan of your environment, not trying to control your environment for your meditation. That was a big issue for me of like, oh, I have to have a place that's silent. <laughs> Every, you know, if anybody stops by, it just ruins it. And I just yeah. wanted to control it, you know? <laughs> but the cool thing, the cool thing with that open focus kind of open awareness type meditation, sort of the type that Sam Harris teaches. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of Sam Harris. I don't but, follow uh, much of his stuff. Man, he he's awesome. Um, yeah. everybody leans to the, that he's an atheist kind of thing, but he's also a neuroscientist and, um, he has a great meditation app, um, and a great meditation course and stuff. His wife yeah. has one for children as well. Um, but he, the cool thing about this style of meditation is as you cultivate this kind of meditation and this kind of practice, it's one that you can bring into your life open eyed and it becomes a walking meditation of awareness and presence mm -hmm. of like, I'm here right now 
I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm not caught up in the future. I'm not regretting the past. I'm not caught up in just solely the narrative of what whatever particular goal or vision that I'm partaking in at this very moment, you know, and, and just helps cultivate that sort of general sense of presence, which in the end makes you feel happier. Yeah, right. You know? I it's love it. um so you know that's sort of been my journey with with you know trying to I think that's probably one of the the most easy accessible free things that anybody can do and it doesn't have to be any particular way there's so many different types that are all good and that for me is the ultimate I'm also so you mentioned plant medicine mm -hmm. I don't know how long form this is I'm such a long form guy I'll talk here I'll we got <laughs> no we got all, all the time you want my friend so I man you know my parents were teenagers of the 60s they were musicians and so one of the reasons that you know I was I was raised and I wasn't a raised to fear drugs they sort of my parents taught me about them they said look these are the type of drugs that are super dangerous these are the kind of activities that are super dangerous you're going to have the opportunity to do all of them and this is the one thing that um and and my parents were also doing drugs you know they weren't doing drugs out in the open or anything like that but they were partying on the weekends and they were and they were pretty just open about teaching us about it and stuff. The one thing that they, they, the, a golden lesson that they gave me was like, Cass, we know that you're going to try everything. Um, we want to teach you about it. What's really dangerous and what's not, you know, but the thing that's the most dangerous about any of them and all of them is never, ever get into a car on them or with them. Never get into a car with somebody else on them or with them. And you're, you're, you're fairly safe if you don't get into a car. So that, you know, it was, it was really practical advice. <laughs> yeah, sage taking, advice, yeah. You know, yeah, like here they're teaching me about all these drugs. Um, and so as a teenager, I went through everything and learned my lessons and stuff like that. Of like Even the kind of people that are surrounding different substances, you know, you have these different groups of people and you could, if you're even halfway aware, you can sort of get the map of like, I do not want to be involved with right. those, people. <laughs> those people. Those people are losing their shit. And you know, the, <laughs> the, the tragedy of all of these different groups of people that become drug addicts on these different substances is, this is where, you know, they all just want to be happy. Mm -hmm. that's 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 really what they're all going after so you know we need to get off our high horse of judgment and realize these people aren't criminals yeah um and they're just lost and you never know what they've experienced and what their normal playing field for me i experienced enough happiness as a child that when i did certain drugs like this it actually reduced my happiness <laughs> You know what I'm saying? At post, yeah. I was like, dude, this is horrible. I feel like shit the next day. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't worth it for me. So it was easy. But, you know, by the time I was 16 or 17 years old, um, I tried it all. And I had tried a lot of, um, in a party setting, I tried a lot of, you know, LSD and mushrooms. And I, uh, you know, I, I really do. I'm really thankful for those as a kid because man, it, you know, I think, I think I even had conversations with my parents. That was the relationship that we had. Like if I was having a bad experience on some psychedelic, I could call my mom. Uh, that's awesome. You know, I've, and I, and I did, and they offered me guidance in that way. And a lot of times it was like, Cass, you know, you know, they were parents too. They weren't just like, but it was, they were of that 19, late sixties, you know, yeah. kind of mindset where they, they didn't want to be judgmental because they were also partying at different times. So it was, it was interesting. You know, I learned the ropes of set and setting in that regard as a teenager, not having it. Mm -hmm. And, it, and, it, but I wouldn't give up any of those experiences as well, because I think it really helped 
think it really helped me see the possibilities of everything, yeah. you know, and to deal with a lot of, dude, I spent a lot of time, the, the bad trips that people talk about, I spent a lot of time crying, just, just like family track, like, like family trauma that probably people call them bad trips because there are things in there that you don't want to deal with. That right. sometimes, that sometimes yeah, come out. The right off. Yeah. And they come out. And, um, I think some of the most beneficial, um, and I'm not advocating anybody to just go and do this. I think that this, what's great about where we're moving as a society is that we're moving in a direction where people are going to be able to go get therapy with a doctor with right. these kind of things. And I do, as I've gotten older, I see the importance and I see, I see the chances of this, this could have went a different direction and it could have been something that was negative for me. But in most cases and with most of my friends, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, um, but you know, it's a, I'm really, really inspired by all of the new research on. Yeah. Like know. Johns Hopkins, you got maps. I mean, all of these guys are, are, I mean, Depression's a, a thing. P PTSD is a thing. Like addiction. Yeah, addiction. That is a thing. And so it's a it is a powerful medicine. And and when used correctly, you know, going back to set and setting, it can help a lot of people. Yeah. And so and I'm with you, man. I'm I'm looking forward to the to the future and, and seeing what comes from that stuff. Yeah, it's just I mean, I talk about with my sister all the time. I mean, she's you know, smokes cigarettes and wants to quit. She's had cancer before, and I was like, man. You need to seek out some like psilocybin therapy. Like they're getting people to quit smoking like in one session. Yeah. yeah, it's a heroic dose of psilocybin with the right therapy and the right doctor. Yeah, I can't wait till that becomes more accessible to more people because I I, I really believe I believe in the power of it. I really yeah. do. Yeah, I agree with you, my friend. Well, um, can can we shift gears real quick and talk a little bit about some music? Yeah, man. Um, Dude, I uh, I watched the the deal that um, Lincoln did, and dude, that made me tear up damn near through the whole fucking thing, dude. They're good. So <laughs> tell me good. about that. Um, how did that come about? You know, I know there was around sixteen hundred um, contestants in this thing, um, but for folks that don't know, kind of explain what that was and how that even got on your radar. Man. It felt cosmic. I'll tell you that it was some, so last, so the Halloween of 2019, I feel like it was last year, but it was, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't this last time, 2020. Wow. Um, so man, me and my wife are heading to Minneapolis to play a show with modest Yahoo and Wookie foot up in Minneapolis at this theater. And we're at a friend of ours condo that's right by the airport. And we're going to be flying out the next morning. And I see I'm on Instagram and I see this ad and it's narrated by Mr. Matthew McConaughey, but it had, it had this super cool, like introspective, uh, sort of hero's journey kind of feel, but with mm. the, with the artist and the songwriter of like, you know, I just felt this feeling. I was like, Cassie, and I, I'm not one to want to enter competitions, especially with America's got talent. And I probably suffer from PTSD just from that experience. <laughs> you know, it's like reality TV show fame. Yeah. It's a weird thing, man. It's, Tell me it's about that before. I, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you did, I'm going to, I'll oh, take good. I'll take the bait. But something, a quote that I read, I thought was really good. You said there's a big difference between fame and, and success as it relates to a successful successful career. And you were referring to your time at America's Got Talent. Yeah, man. I mean, dude, it's like, think about with, with America's Got Talent, the situation was I didn't have a goal or a vision to be on America's Got Talent. I woke up one day after playing at the corner bar over off of like by SMU where I had this weekly gig and a buddy of mine called and he's like, he, he was like sort of acting as our manager. He's like, dude, I really want you to go to this audition. My brother-in-law hooked it up and I went <laughs> as just a chance. So America's got talent just sort of happened. Like it yeah. was like, 
I woke up one day and the next day, next thing you know, I'm going to Hollywood. I'm part of this, what seemed to be a circus. <laughs> it, and I was at, you got to understand the kind of mindset I had was anti-establishment DIY. I was into bands like no effects, the idea of selling myself on some reality TV show. First off, I didn't think that what I did would be viable and would even work. And I wasn't into the idea of other people like, you know, telling my story the way they saw it. I wasn't into having it like a Pepsi can or being yeah. this product. And it's such a weird kind of thing when you're an artist and you're selling music and you're, you're trying to keep it authentic, but at the same time it becomes this business thing. And it's, you know, this is me talking now, but back then I had this, this very fixed idea of like wanting to keep it as, real as possible and have a grassroots thing that was real and have have a career built in people incorporating your music into their life versus just a flash fame so uh, here i was getting the very thing that i probably had thought about too much and i probably attracted that shit you to manifested myself it, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that fear <laughs> i ended up going and, and had this crazy experience, which dude taught me so much. Um, I'm so glad that it happened because that very thing of like learning the difference between fame and success, fame is in other people's eyes. Mm. Success is in yours. So success is a personal thing. You know what I mean? Fame is like the shadows of other people's opinions. And that thing is complete illusion. And, and I mean, it, it's, it's, and it's, it, it, it can be a horrible thing, especially when you start buying into it. And it's almost, it's super hard to not buy into it, especially if all the opinions tend to be good, you know, <laughs> our, our ego wants to buy into the, Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's who I am. I'm yeah. that guy. Yeah. yeah. I'm that guy. I'm that good guy. That happy guy that sings the positive music, you know, <laughs> um, so you buy into this fixed identity, mm, mm. this fixed identity that's defined by the overall shadow of other people's opinion. Yeah. And that's a tricky thing that I feel like a lot of people uh, do, especially with our phones. We get, other, we get people's opinions real time. You know <laughs> what I mean? And, and if, the more famous you are, the more opinions you've got, yeah. you know, and the more they keep on building into that identity that they think you are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a tricky kind of thing to not have somewhat of a breakdown. And I, I have, um, I have a lot of, uh, compassion for people that put themselves out there. And I think it takes a lot of work to maintain like uh, psychological health in any kind of like show business or having any kinds of fame, even politicians or whatever. I mean, it's such a tricky thing that you don't think about until, you're experiencing it. And I yeah. did my, I tried my hardest to not wrap myself around that whole thing. And I, and I still wrapped myself around it. And how I was still, that come, how was that coming out of it? Cass, like you finish runner up. Um, a lot of folks thought you were going to win the whole damn thing. Like what were the expectations you had of yourself or that, you know, that you were getting from other people at that time? Well, I was, you know, I was sort of locked into a lot of uh, legal, deals um they exercised all of their options legally so they do these open kind of things of like legal options where it's like you can't move on until they release you but they're not you're not guaranteed a deal so with me they the minute i didn't win they exercised full on all their legal options and i think it was because it was a close it was a close competition you know up till the end they said and they they probably saw that this was something that they were going to be able to package up and be able to make some money. They wanted an album out by Christmas. The show ended by September. So like within an hour of me losing, they were introducing me to like, this is going to be your manager. This is going to be, this is the guy that's going to write your songs. This, you know, and I'm sort of, you know, dramatizing it, but it yeah. felt like that. Mm -hmm. And here I was like, I just was this close to a million bucks. I really wasn't that, I wasn't that heartbroken because at the time it was the most success I had experienced. And I had 
some money because I'd been selling merchandise while I was on the show. How old and were I you then, Cass? Super, huh? How old were you then? I was 27. 27. Uh, and so I was sitting in a pretty good spot where I didn't know what a million dollar was, but I knew what 20,000 was in my bank account with all my bills paid and I felt rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely wasn't chasing. Like I definitely felt this need to back away. And so I like completely abandoned the whole America's Got Talent scenario and went back home and tried to get clear because I, it was such and also too so when you're on those tv shows the effects of being on those tv shows and them having producing you in a certain way and everybody seeing that and the, the wave of hysteria on a personal level from all your personal friends family town everybody's jazz people are texting you you know you feel like michael jackson or that's probably not a good example you feel super <laughs> great. um you know really really hot you know what i mean so yeah. and they also build these kind of perspectives as this is your big shot you know this is the moment that defines the rest of your life you know it's super it's tv man you know they make yeah. it really draw and and you buy into it you buy into it that this is it. If it doesn't happen now, you know, so that, so I'm coming off of that whole kind of train. And I was like, man, I knew that it, it was just a TV show. It was a great experience. I learned a lot of lessons. The people that ran it that I met, they were all great. I'm not talking any trash about, about any of it's the nature right. of reality TV. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, but I came back home. And I tried to just go back, come back to myself and figure out how I'm going to just go back to pursuing my career. And so I came back home, I recorded an album. I decided that I needed to, you know, buy a piece of land. And, and so I took about, um, I recorded an album released that album and then took some time off and, and built this house that we we live at now. We bought this piece of land, lived in a camper and me and my friends all chipped together. And we built this house. Oh, that's and, awesome. And it's sort of, I knew that setting this house, building this house would set up the foundation and in a practical way too, because like, you know, my mortgage here building this home was half of what I was paying living over in Dallas for a home that I would want my family to live in. So I was like, it was the practical thing. It was the time that I needed to get up, to get out of, of here and mm. to get into my body and my hands and to see what, what's possible. And just, you know, it was like, it was like the best therapy that I could have ever had, yeah. you know, a year of focused vision on providing a place for my family to live probably till we die. Yeah, that was the vibe. And <clears throat> so it all began here in this house right here. We built it and then we started pursuing our career again on an independent on our terms independently. I ended up getting out of all the legal binds that I was in with the TV show, which mm -hmm. they were kind enough to release me from. Um, and they could have hung things up. Yeah. But then from there, you know, that's that's the kind of that sets up the mentality for competitions. I wasn't about any competitions. I didn't want to, <laughs> I really didn't want to compete again. It was super heavy. I wanted yeah. to just like pursue my career. And I always seen like most, most competitions where seem very like, you know, you got to pay a submission fee and then uh -huh. like, they just seem sort of rigged and I just never was into any of that. So let's fast forward. Yeah. I've, I've been pursuing my career for 13 years, 12 years past, you know, America's Got Talent. Haven't entered one competition, just been traveling around the country, trying to do my thing, facing fear wherever I can find it, <laughs> trying, to, trying to bring my life together in a holistic manner, trying to keep my marriage together. You know, for the first few years, I pursued a career. My son had started school, so I was pursuing a career by myself, living in a van, uh, playing solo acoustic shows, doing whatever I could to hold on to that and still it be balanced and provide for my family. 
And you never took a job, right, Cass? Like you never had another job per se. No, you were doing the no. Thing. You know, I've picked up. I've had some side hustles from time to time. Um, <laughs> you know, like in the construction world, where yeah. I would take on like some kind of flooring job here and there, but it was never more than a week or two. You know, I I, I hate working for people. Um, <laughs> I'm with you, man. Yeah, it's just not. It's just not I'm my thing. You. I. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty much just music. And it was always fairly, it was always fairly simple and fairly practical for me to make basic needs, especially since I had moved out here to the country, I'd reduced my overhead. You know, I got a set up in a situ situation for a long time. You know, it was only going to take about 2,500 bucks a month for us to, to be able to get by. And, um, that was doable, even yeah. if I was playing bar gigs or whatever. So I yeah. just started pursuing my music and pursued it you know, trying to, trying to make it the best that I could for the last 12 years and continually, you know, it, 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 it sort of, you know, slowly was building. I mean, this kind of career is, it's tough. I mean, if you can, if you can achieve, I always said to myself, if I can achieve a hundred people that have incorporated our music into their life and that brings some kind of value to them and they show up, man, to me, that's, that's raging success. Yeah. So you know, of course, I'll take as many as, as, as that will happen. But dude, you can have a nice career being able to play for 100 people wherever. So I was working towards that. And I was, I was achieving that. And, yeah. and then I was heading to a show in Minneapolis, on that path. With my wife, we were going to fly up, play with Modest Yahoo and Wikifoot. And I seen this ad. And it had this this kind of well-being sanctuary vibe, which was Lincoln's new thing of trying to find, you know, meaning in one's life and how, you know, how they can help with that. But they were trying to find the path of, a, of an artist and a songwriter to help chart their course. Mm. And, and I wrote a little essay. I was inspired. So I saw the Instagram ad. Yeah. And it was like one or two days left to submit. And I knew it, man. Like I've no, I've, I haven't known many things for sure in my life, but for this, this is, and it's such a weird thing for me to know. I was like, it just all fit. And I said, Cassie, we wrote this song on the road, every road I'm on that previous summer. And I said, Cassie, we have to enter this. I was like, we're going to win this semifinalist at the very least. I know yeah, beyond yeah. a shadow of a doubt, we're going to win this. And I like, I knew every, just, I just knew. So I called a studio. I called a friend that could film it. Um, Colin, my buddy. And I said, can you guys meet me um, tomorrow before we fly out to film this? And I filmed the submission and I wrote an essay and the essay that I wrote, I just mentioned what our family's sort of journey is and like what we're trying, um, what we're trying to do, how we're trying to cultivate presence in our life. And we're trying to be able to, you know, every road I'm on is my home, meaning like whatever tragedy I'm in, wherever we're going, whatever we're doing, trying to cultivate some kind of presence and meaning mm -hmm. in our life. And, and also, you know, paving our own path, you know, sort of defining our future and having vision. And, and so I wrote this little one pager and I sent the submission of every road I'm on. And two weeks later, I was sitting in the deer stand, bow hunting, ding. And it was like six in the morning, I got the notification. And dude, the whole time I was telling Cassie, I was like, I know that we're, we're gonna win this. And I'm not that cocky and that egotistical, but man, this like really hit home of sometimes you just know things and you've yeah. got to follow that voice. Yeah. So at this point, I didn't know how big of a deal this was. I just knew that we were going to win 17 grand. <laughs> so I was excited because I needed some money. You know, we, <laughs> we weren't broke, but it was, it was tough. I mean, mm -hmm. we'd been all out the road, you know, we'd making just enough to get by. So $17,000 was going to change the world for us. So, we win that and I get a call from the producers and they start explaining, they start explaining what this is like, what this actually is. And they're like, we want to, we want to send a film crew to Paris to film a little documentary on your story and your song. And I was like, okay, you know, in my mind at the time, I think, oh, a couple people are going to show up. 
you know, maybe one nice camera and some producer and it's going to be real, real simple. And I was like, so they're like, can we do this? Like, uh, like here, like next week. And, um, so at the time Cassie was finishing up some surgeries for her breast cancer. And when I got that call, we were, we were like, she was getting out of the hospital and they like wanted to come like the next week. And I asked them, I was like, well, how many people are going to be coming? And they're like, well, I mean, the whole crew, I think it could be like 30, 40. Oh, and I was like, Holy, whoa, what do you, you know, they're bringing Hollywood to Novice, <laughs> Texas. And literally like they showed up and it was like, they shut the County road down. They had this, they had this, uh, animal rights advocate fly in from New Mexico. They, they knew we lived on a farm, so they had to have somebody that was an animal rights sort of uh, watch, you know, that no animals were hurt in the filming of all of this stuff. So, and it was all like, you oh, know, wow. super way beyond anything I'd ever imagined. And then they told me, they said, well, then we're going to film and this is going to air the night of the Grammys and we want you to go to the Grammys with the other contestants. And that's going to be the last night for people to vote and who wins the funny thing about it incredible thing is cassie for the last year previous had been saying you know what and cassie's a new she's a new songwriter she's just starting to get on stage and from my perspective it was a little bit like far reaching she's like i think we should i think we're gonna get to go to grandma sometime and uh, i was like i was sort of like oh cassie i was like maybe someday but not anytime <laughs> You know, like maybe when we're old or, or yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm sometimes a realist and sometimes I'm a cynic, even though I do, you know, I, I'm definitely a dreamer and optimism. I do have a little bit of that from experiencing such a long career, yeah. of, you know, low level, moderate success. And I was just like, ah, you know, let's, uh, but anyways, she made it happen here, yeah. here, here we were within, you know, this last year, she'd been saying all this, and we we're going to get to go to the Grammys. Yeah, in a different way. But everything yeah. that was happening was just like, it was just cosmic, man. Yeah. And then for that whole experience to roll in to 2020, we were at the, we were at, when, when they announced that Kobe Bryant died, we were there. We were at the stadium he played in. Dang. We were heading to the Grammys that day. And then from that point on, I mean, I mean, just 2020 just unveiled and yeah, you know, it was just this incredible sequence of events where we ended up winning the competition. We ended up filming um, a couple Lincoln car commercials um, to making all the right people to everything being stopped. The yeah. So what, when was that? Because I, I, I watched the, the film and for, for folks listening, you can check this out on YouTube, but you got to hang out with folks like John Cleary, Ruthie Foster, Mr. McConaughey himself. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, man, and, and what that experience So that, that happened in February of 2020. Oh, right before. We, yeah, we filmed in February of 2020, and uh, it was a journey um, where I was visiting all these different influential songwriters and artists and basically just telling them my story and getting some advice. You know, I was like picking up little – little bits of advice um the, on this road trip that was going to end at capitol records on um, capitol studios in la yeah. where i was going to record this and the idea was you know bring all these different artists in have them influence you know the story and the journey and the song and then it would all end in recording at capitol studios with john batiste and al schmidt and daryl brown producing and um it was incredible I mean, it was, it was really, truly, it was incredible. It was like a, a two and a half week thing. Um, Matthew McConaughey was everything that you would ever imagine Matthew McConaughey was. Yeah. <laughs> he was very kind, yeah. very self-directed, super strong kind of uh, sense of, what his purpose was in that moment that yeah. was really like sort of like I, I you when you see someone like that that's able to generate such a successful career you wonder like well what is it about it and i really mm -hmm. think it's that i think that he's such a self-directed focused guy that he's sort of a master in that regards of knowing what he wants in any situation and being a kind normal human being but at the same time remaining focused and being the cause 
mm-hmm. whatever he's doing versus being affected, you know, and uh, it was, it was cool, man. And he was really kind and we got to sit down and, you know, talk about life and talk about tra- traveling with family and the ins and outs of all that. And he, we met at a hat shop where he had me a hat made right before our eyes at uh, Aspen Hatter company, um, which was really cool seeing the whole process and getting to pick it all out. Beaver with a a quarter curl around it, you know, it's super (laughs) cool. And, uh, and then we moved on and met with Ruthie Foster, who's a legendary Texas songwriter. And, um, we met with Tank and the Bangas. We went mm-hmm. to New Orleans, which was really cool meeting with her and Chawa, another New Orleans uh, group. And one of my favorite uh, moments was meeting with John Cleary. Um, John Cleary is like, man, he's a legend. Um, and he had it was such a he's had such a strong history with music. And, you know, it's just I, I was a big fan of his before the this whole thing so getting to sit down with him and tell him my story and hear his advice you know and get to, i went and watched him play the night before was uh and got to jam with him yeah i was and gonna we, say it looked like y'all had a blast with him on the keys and you were playing it was, it was so special it really was he's like you know there's artists a lot of people if you're not a music you know, musicologist or really deep into new orleans music or blues music you might not know who john cleary is Uh, But he is like fine wine and everybody can't afford fine wine. And, you know, (laughs) fine wine ain't at your corner store. Boone's Farm is at your corner store. (laughs) That's he's had a career like that, too, where he, you know, has just he's just pure, man. He's Mm -hmm. just so inspiring. And, uh, you know, it ended at the at Capitol Studios where we recorded the song. Yeah. And uh it ended cool. And then right after that, I'm like, okay, this big opportunity, the commercial is going to air in April. We're, we're, we're lined up to play Coachella and oh, yeah. they had booked us. They had booked us for Coachella following the co- release of the commercial and they were going to film that. And like, there was all these big plans. And so I was like, oh man, I need an album. And I had all these songs that I, that had been written over this last year that me and Cassie had wrote. And so all the right people, the idea for the album started happening all at the same time in February um, from the Grammy trip on, um, like all the right people, the album was truly inspired by this cosmic sort of zone kind of in the flow energy that had been happening through the Lincoln thing. Yeah. And the idea was just honoring our relationships, honoring like, what makes me me and you you um all of the people in our lives and that's like our relationships being honored and being in balance is the real value that we have and is the reason why we're able to have done the things that we've done think about all of the people that have blessed you whether with words or with different kinds of support and so like i was just having this moment of clarity of of realizing that i can't take credit for all these blessings in my life. Mm. I can't take full credit. I can't, I can't, it's not just me. It's my parents, it's my sisters. It's all the musicians that have, you know, been so kind to teach me, um, you know, like, you know, about music. You know, I'm, I'm a self-taught sort of, I never went to music school or anything and I've gotten to play with all these amazing musicians that have so kindly sort of helped me and taught me. And it was just, everything was coming into focus, you know, of like how much people have invested in who I am and helped create the, the, the best of me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so all the right people sort of came out of that spirit. And I invited a few of my favorite musicians from around the United States to come meet here at the house i invited one of my favorite music producers and we all got together and um recorded a collection of songs and you know it was like recorded in a way where the super organic just sort of live performance right here in this living room so you recorded everything there recorded that album the whole album was recorded right Mm -hmm. here uh in my living room and upstairs i've got a 
control room and stuff in a studio. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was really, it was really cool, man. I mean, this, this That's album it. is real performances. There's, you know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I'm sort of just in a place right now where the experience, if I can have an experience with other people that feels really good, that's what we were, that, that I believe that that transcends more than any kind of perfect thing, mm. you know, of like us, of, when you listen to this record, this is four guys, five guys in a room having an experience together that's real and it's capturing a moment of time. Yeah. You know, and there's so many albums that have made huge influence on me where that was the magic thing about it. I was, I was transported to the room that they were in when they were having these moments. And that yeah. element of music is lost a little bit with a lot of modern music, really cool soundscapes and really cool sounds, really hi-fi stuff that's going on with technology. And I think I'm, I'm not against that. I think that's a really cool thing too. But on a mystical level, I'm really attracted to a pure snapshot. Mm-hmm. And the guy that produced, that co-produced this record is a master at ambient miking. So recording dimensional properties in a whole way. And he, um, he innovated this technology called real feel that is, um, you use it in the mastering section where it it's basically, they advertise it as like the, the cure for digital music on a therapeutic level on how, you know, a, a digital file is, say it's like 24K, like it's 24,000 samples per second, or, and there's different sampling rates, but any, on a CD or any kind of digital file, it's a bunch of little snapshots, okay? So it's recording, you know, 24,000 samples per second or 96 or whatever the sample rate is of the, the DAW. Well, the theory is, and, and the belief with music therapy is that those little gaps reduce the effect that music has on our bodies and through kinesiology and testing on our brain activity through kinesiology and different testing music therapists have started recognizing that digital music has been reduced Hmm. you know and so um that's a whole podcast in itself um and there's a new book by victor wooten called the spirit of music that talks a lot about that that's super cool um i'm gonna write it down it's incredible but so rob brought to the table that kind of perspective of trying to do something in a pure way and trying to trying to really tap in to how we're feeling as humans experiencing something together versus being super focused on how perfect it is you know yeah. and try to really capture the vibe um it's a it's a beautiful album i am uh, i I started listening to a lot of it as I prepared for this interview. Um, there's some new favorite songs. Like the, the words you sing, man, they hit me. You know what I mean? Like they hit me and it's like, God damn, I feel that, you know? I don't know if we're, we're in the same place, like, you know, going through this, this stuff together sometimes. Um, that but, hero's uh, journey, man. You know, yeah. like, that's what's great about, about it is that we all are on. We might be at different points, but I really believe that like we're all on this like sort of same kind of thing. Yeah. So you mentioned a few books. I'm curious to know what's uh, what's a book that you have either reread most or that you gift to other people the most. Well, the one, I'm the 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 book that I'm reading now, The Spirit of Music, is super cool. But it is his second book. His first book, Victor Wooten's book, is called The Music Lesson, Jesus. and it's been a book that uh, really made a huge difference in in my life and that i've definitely gifted um i love that book um effortless mastery for any musicians you know that's by kenny werner and did did, did daniel donato recommend that yeah he probably did he probably did that's like a musician's book man it's it's all about getting out of your way and you know being entranced in this music you know and it's a, it's a, it's a really great book. Um, you know, I've been in the last year, I've really been into Ryan holiday. Oh yeah. 
a lot. Great um, ego, yeah. is, ego is the enemy. Yeah. Um, all of the, I, did, I never realized how uh, I'm attracted to the whole stoic thing. Like stoic philosophy. My, man. Idea, my idea of being a stoic, of being stoic, was not what it actually is. They're much more. <laughs> like a buddhist it's much it's much more mystical and much more practical like it's so practical and so empowering i'm Mm -hmm. i'm super moved by most of ryan holiday's work yeah yeah um he's done a lot i I don't know what his latest one out is probably my favorite by him is the obstacle is the way yeah it's one of the first ones i read yeah um you've been doing this music thing a long time so what is um, what is some of the worst advice you have heard? Some of the, I don't know if it would be advice, but it would be the worst kind of mentality and mindset for a young singer songwriter to think that uh, a, a record deal is the goal. Hmm. You know, and what a record deal is, is a loan, a debt, and I think the kind of perspective when, when an artist is always looking for some money outside of himself, a debt to acquire, to be able to pursue a career, I think that's a bad way to go about it. And I think it, it's it obviously, you know, there's sometimes you got to take out loans, you know what I mean? But in the music business, loans are tra- they're, they're classically just sort of shitty. And the kind of people, the kind of people that you're dealing with these companies and stuff are just, it's sort of just unfair. And I'm really a big advocate of trying to um, figure out a way to do it yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? To, to not, to not go into debt um, and take other people's money, like the whole investor kind of thing. Like it's, it's just until you get to a point where you have a full deck in your hands and you're really ready for an investment. I think for young artists to have, you know, everybody thinks it's this money thing of like, you're going to get this guy that's going to invest millions of dollars into your career. And all of a sudden you're going to have this amazing career. Now the, that's complete bullshit. What happens is that the money buys you a certain sort of visibility, mm. but you still don't have a real nuts and bolts, brick and mortar career or business. So I think people need to like the artists need to, to go about this in a practical way of like, you know, you're building with practical nuts and bolts and it's going to take time for people to incorporate your music into their life. And mm-hmm. that's really what the goal is. The goal is to, to have your music bringing value to people and to affecting people and, and to having a business created out of that. And it just takes time. So I think people need to realize that to pursue a career in music, um, just give it time. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's, and enjoy if you can set it up and design it in a way that is enjoyable, there's no rush to get to any point. You can enjoy it, Yeah. you know, and don't, you can define your own success by your enjoyment of it being a life worth living versus some like, Oh, I'm sacrificing everything because I want to be the next Bruno Mars <laughs> or, 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 you know what I mean? I'm going to, I'm going to go pay yeah. my dues. Well, I'm going to yeah. go pay my dues and I'm going to go into debt for seven albums. And <laughs> I just don't believe in that shit. And and yeah. that's just not the path for me. And I think, um, I think it's possible, you know, to, to let the cream float to the top in an organic, natural way. Do, do you refine what you do? You know, obviously try not to go in debt. I know because I went in debt. I took other people's <laughs> money. I had horrible scenarios. I've been ripped off. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've, I've been down that road. It's such a tricky thing being in the music business and the business of art and emotions. Mm. You know, you're selling emotions. You're selling art. You're selling a vibe. Right. A feeling. It's such a, it's a vulnerable spot for the artist because we just like our society, we're looking up, please help me. You know what I mean? I just, I'm just this artist that wants to do this thing. And you have all this, these crooks and these sharks that yeah. take advantage of people a lot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that was the worst advice. What's some of the best advice you've heard? Like something um, that impacted you, whether it was from a mentor. Follow, or- follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. You know, I love Joseph it. Campbell, that voice inside. It's like, go meet your edge, jump off. You know, risk, don't be afraid, 
to risk things. I've, I've continually taken everything and pretty much not in a stupid way, but risked it all been prepared to, to go to the edge and to go into the unknown and just keep on pushing. And, uh, yeah. Julia Cameron has a great quote. I don't know if you've read the book, The Artist Way, but her quote says, leap and the net will appear. Yeah, you gotta leap though. You gotta yeah. leap. Yeah. And it's like, it's like if you're not, if you're not out there, you know, pursuing um and whatever that is, it isn't just music. It's like anything that you exactly. love to do. Yeah. If you're not out there doing it, everybody used to ask me, well, what's your plan B? <laughs> I had no plan B. Yeah. And that's why I spent all my time knocking on all the doors, doing everything that I had to do, uh, what, whatever it took. I mean, because when you're, when you're, when you're playing it safe and you're like, you're always looking up like, Oh, I'm going to do it. You know, when I do this, when I get this, 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 and this, then I'll be able to do that. You okay. doing all this stuff is when you're missing all the opportunities, you know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I really believe in that. And I've, I've lived my life like that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny too, because this, the great thing about having a little lick of success in other people's eyes is it completely erases the 250 times they've seen you fail. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and it's like, you know, the few times that I've had, I, I have, you know, all kinds of things that feel successful in my life. That's why I love having goals and doing projects because that kind of presence feels successful to me, whether it's, you know, planning fruit trees or whatever it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that people just need to, to know that like people that have good things happening and have, you know, hit a lick, it, they have tons of failures. That's the thing. I think a lot of tons. people, especially with social media, we just see the highlight reel. We don't see all the shit that didn't. And work that's out. great too. Cause I don't feel like, you know what my shit, I don't, I'm not ready to show you my shit. It's my business. <laughs> It, I got over that whole thing of like, yeah, it is the highlight reel. And if you don't realize that it's your fault. Yeah. Um, yeah. It don't mean that I need, to, this is me and my wife talk about this all the time. I'm like, do you feel like you feel fake? Just like posting stuff to get you. I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> people, people are smart enough. People are smart enough to know that this is just some kind of like, it's just a, a thing. It's just yeah. an artistic expression of like, what our hopes and our dreams are. You get a little picture inside my ego. You know mm. what I mean? <laughs> it, it is what it is. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, there's no way around it. There's no way to be authentic on social media, dude. You know what I mean? Cause you're producing your own feed. You're producing yourself. It's all, it's like, you know, it's like the whole saying of like, you know, you can't like, the minute you observe something in the wild that it changes its behavior, yeah. you know, like yeah, you can't yeah, yeah, yeah. naturally observe something in the wild and, and their, their, their behavior, you know and I, I mean? You can't see the way they naturally behave. It's sort of like that of like, what do I, what, what do I want to post today? Hmm. What's, what's the real thing? Well, there's so many real things too. We're complex beings. Right. It's like I can have a shitty two minutes first thing in the morning because I spilled the coffee. That could be something I could post. But you know what? I don't want to post that. I want to post that I stepped on the scale and I lost four pounds. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there's so many things. That, <laughs> there's so many things you could post, you know, and it's like I try to keep it light. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't I think people are smart enough to know that we're all fucking human and going through some shit. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. And we're all, we're all heading the same direction too, by the way. <laughs> this is a, that's a, sets up a great segue for my next question. Um, what is your most embarrassing moment on stage? Oh, let's see. I don't know. I don't know. Embarrassing. I mean, I've had my zipper undone a few times <laughs> and, you know, at what like, point in the show did you realize it when or my it son after? when my son walked up on stage and was like your, your, your zipper's undone <laughs> it was like maybe five songs after i'd been up there i was yeah, like that's what's awesome funny is nobody else was point i wish somebody in the crowd was just like, hey, you know yeah <laughs> you know i mean 
Yeah, that, uh, you know, I'm not easily embarrassed. Yeah. Um, I've had some scary moments on stage that were full of fear of not being good enough. Uh, what was that, like an imposter syndrome? Man, it's just when, you know, I've, I've been through different things in my life where I've, like, injured my voice. I've had, I've had voice therapy and it's like when that, you know, I felt like the star running back at one time and then I was injured at one point in my career, I felt, you know, invincible and like, you know, super over identified with my talent and, and me being a singer. And then I lost that for about a year from nerve damage in my neck and then coming. And for me, that rebuilding of my ability to sing I rebuilt it in a different way that wasn't so wrapped up in that as my single identity, Uh, but it still was pretty scary. Like not being able to do the things that I used to be able to do so easily and like facing the new me and accepting the new me and, you know, just regaining confidence and just, I am, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and it's going to be what it is, you know? And, and, and that's okay. The important thing, it's so easy for an artist to get caught up in his head that he's not good enough yet mm. to make an album, to play a show or whatever. I man, I really feel like the important part is that you're not really progressing unless you're opening the channel and sharing that with people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sort of, it's so easy to go so deep and egotistical about what you want your, you know, your art to be whatever right just let it be what it is yeah you know i mean i think i think that uh that's the way i'm attracted to doing it for sure of course i want to get better of course i want to do my best but you know that's something i'm dealing with right now man and have been for a while it's like when to keep pushing like when to keep going or and when to surrender to what is you know, and trying to find that balance as an entrepreneur and, and as like a content creator with the Converse Cowboy stuff, I'm trying mm-hmm. to find the balance, you know? Yeah. You got any man. advice for me? Just do you, bro. You know, <laughs> it's like, I mean, that's the, I, even in a debate, you know, it's like one of the things, if you tell the truth, like you, you, it's hard to lose a debate when you just, you know, are just doing you and just yeah. telling the truth of what you know and what you've experienced. And there's just, there's something really powerful about that. And you know what? Uh, We want to control the effects of what we're doing, you know, and how, who gravitates to it and who doesn't, but the ambition is something you got to watch out for. Yeah. When you don't want to become a politician in your pursuits, you don't want to start moving towards things that don't interest you just because you think that, you know, there's going to be a reaction and you're going to be able to make more money. I think I'm, I'm that, that area, ugh, you know yeah, what right. I mean? I, I think that it clouds the ambition really gets in the way of, of authenticity. Yeah. Um, so I you guys just got to watch out for that, you know, and just, you, you seem like in your situation, you seem like you've been pretty successful just doing you and, leaning into what you're interested in and it's yeah. it's for me it's really cool i've been watching all your stuff and i've met you and you know i know your backstory from bubba and stuff and it's really really cool to see what you're doing and you're 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 elevating you know like i feel like i feel like the whole cowboy country culture gets a bad generalized rap for being ignorant uh. Yeah. Um, for being into things that aren't conscious for, and I feel like, you know, obviously that's just generalized and it's bullshit, right. but you're, you know, you're opening up a culture to ideas that aren't a part of that general idea, old right. ways, religious, conservative, you know, like all of the things that are wrapped up into even the area that I'm living, no one would think that, I'm Paris, Texas, born and raised, you know what I mean? And and Texas is a lot more, you know, being a cowboy is a lot more than just like going to a honky tonk and riding a horse. You know what I mean? There's a lot of depth in 
having a relationship with the land and with these animals and being able to take care of yourself, individual liberties. Um, there's so much, there's so much depth in all of it that I think just gets generalized and left out. And I, th I thank you for raising it up and for following your heart and, you know, just having interesting conversations, you know what I mean? In, in this round. So, yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, that means a lot. I really appreciate it. And yeah, that like for a long time before I even started this, I thought like I was the only one that was like living this cowboy lifestyle and then also this conscious awareness, you know, lifestyle. But what I'm finding out is the more I open up, the more vulnerable I am, the more it's resonating with people and people are reaching out and saying, thank you. Thank you. You know, they, I guess, may be scared, kind of like I was. I was scared to say something because I thought I may offend somebody or they may judge me, but it yeah. hadn't been like that at all. There may be a few haters out there, and if that's the well, case. There then, always will be, yeah, yeah right? They're not aligned with me, but it's been a good ride, so I appreciate you saying that. I really, you know, it reminds me of, uh, you know, like I'm really into hunting, and uh, I live in a super rural area, and we deer hunt, and um, I love the whole thing, but I'm also a part of a conscious sort of community of musicians. And a lot of my friends are vegans and vegetarians. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's like, dude, if I make, if I show a post of my son killing a deer, I'll like, you know, it's like a mass exodus. It's like <laughs> all of the hippies that have this idea of who I was are like <laughs> messaging me, you know, how, how can you do that? And um, it's, it's, it's such, it's, we're such complex cultures and narratives it's such a complex thing people just generalize what it is to be this or that um yeah. one guy that i really love i don't know if how, how into hunting you are but there's this guy donnie vincent do you know of donnie vincent i don't know wildlife biologist but he elevates the way that you're sort of elevating and bringing conversations to another level he does that in regards to like hunting oh, and right the on. science behind it of like giving credit to like we wouldn't exist as a species without, you know, this sort of the hunting element of who we are. Mm -hmm. And um, he sort of goes into the, the, just the, the deepness and the richness of that relationship and the sacrifice and all of these things that just get generalized. And um, they made, you know, I feel like they're just reduced to just, um, just being like violent acts of, unconsciousness where you don't need to do that. Well, I'm sorry, but people can't grow food year round. It just right. doesn't happen. And right. when you want to take care of yourself and you want to provide for yourself and you want to be, in my opinion, you want to be healthy. And a lot of people will probably be upset about that. I feel like, you know, meat's a part of that for me. What you is know? the guy's name again, Cass? Donnie Vincent. Donnie Vincent. I'm going to check him out. Brother, I got one more question for you. Um, Knowing what you know now, if you could, hypothetically speaking, get a message out to the world, if you could put it on a billboard, what would that message say? Just do whatever you want to do. I mean, that's in micro and macro. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just you've got, you've got to be true to yourself. You know, obviously you need to be, you know, you know, in a place <laughs> Even even if you're making bad decisions, you almost have to learn the ropes from doing what you got to do. And I feel like there's so many people that are too uh, that aren't doing what they want to do that are afraid. So just follow your bliss, do what you want to do, and all the lessons will be learned and you'll get through it. You know, um, that's I love it. That's the thing, man. I love it, dude. Um, before you play one. <clears throat> let folks know where they can find you Cass. Yeah, man. Um, Cass Haley music, um, everywhere, you know, on, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, all the, all of the, all, all of the places <laughs> where, uh, where will you be playing? I don't know when this will come out, but so May ish, May ish or June, like where are you going to be playing anywhere live? Man, we're going to be hitting the road. Um, so, I guess by the time this comes out, we we're playing Red Rocks on the 29th. And I saw April. that, dude. I yeah. saw that. Yeah, we're really excited about that with That's our good awesome. buddy Trevor Trevor Hall, who's a amazing conscious musician. Mm -hmm. um, but we're gonna be touring um, through the Midwest and a little bit to the East in May as well. So you can check CassHaley.com for all of our dates. Mm -hmm.
Um, I'm going to play a brand new song that uh, isn't out just yet, but it's called In the Middle of It. And this one, it's uh, it was written in the middle of 2020, and it's written from a perspective of feeling lost and not knowing what the hell is about to happen. So mm. something that we all sort of in the vibe of in 2020. In the middle of it. Started so clearly, oh 2020. Rolling on the house train, the new decade on the brand new frame. Then I hear a click and a bang, a drop dead pop of the whole thing. Holla for you to hear my name, but it does no good for we all the same. Way down in the middle of it, way down in the middle of it, way down in the middle of it, way down in the middle of it. We in the middle of it. I'm in the middle of it, child. In the middle of it, new thoughts have left my mind. Rational, not this time. Fed fear through a hot five feet. Little Debbie snacks with the Trump kind of greed. Had the hell's been long paid. Right here in the land of the brave. A new conversation, a deadly contagion. Way down. Way down in the middle of it, way down in the middle of it, way down in the middle of it, in the middle of it, we in the middle of it, y'all, in the middle of it. Who's gonna take the lead? Science left out to bleed. Mistrust has rocked our mind. Power is in decline. No love, just battle lines. Black death, alarming times. White men refuse to see what they wrote and who they be. Way down in the middle of it. 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 In the middle of it, we in the middle of it, child. In the middle of it, in the middle of it, or in the middle of it, in the middle of it, in the middle of it. Started so clearly, oh, 2020. I love it, dude. You have such a beautiful voice, Cass. Oh man, thank, thank you. I appreciate. So, what What would you classify? I know you were hardcore reggae for a while, like back in the Woodbelly days, and now it's more like soul music, man. Like, what do you classify? What's the genre, man? Because you're right there with like a Nako Bear or like the Trevor Halls, <laughs> you know. Like, what What do you call that? And you know, it's it's like I'm the the. I love all kinds of music and I'm, I'm actually working on, you know, a record that is a, a, a tribute to redneck outlaw country, but it's a reggae album. All right. So, um, you know, it's a mixture of things, man. I, I'm really, I'm really into, you know, country folk sort mm. of blues, you know, um, uh, music from the area that I'm in, you know, mm. and like, I love old, old blues and uh, I just love songs. I love writing songs. And it's really more song centered than necessarily any kind of style because I love all kinds of styles. But yeah. me being from the South and being raised, you know, pretty much poor from the South, country and blues and bluegrass yeah. is sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely um, a part of my part of my history. And my wife is as country as it gets. <laughs> Right on. Yeah, and I didn't mean to imply that it it, it has to have a genre. I just I was just curious no, if it had a name. Totally, totally. Man, that's a thing. And a genre is, you know, good people 
people like those general terms, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, but think about this. When you think about someone like, you know, let's say Paul Simon, you know, Paul Simon, like he's a songwriter, bro. Right. He, he, he might get the best musicians from Africa to play on this album, but then he might get, you know what I'm saying? So, and it's all about the songs. Yeah. It's all about the story. And yeah. uh, that's what I'm into. Yeah. yeah. I love all styles of music and I think it, it's all powerful. Dude. You know? Well, I love what you're doing, man. Thanks for your time on the show today. I, um, like I said, I got, all, I got to listen into your stuff more, um, in the, you know, in doing my research and I'm, I'm looking forward to catching the show. I want to come see you live again. Um, I think the first time I saw you was at like Buffalo Joe's. Oh yeah. During, back in the day, you know? Oh yeah. But, uh, no, I'm looking forward to, to getting out and seeing you live. Well, man, hopefully next time we can do this in person. So, we oh, don't yeah. have all, you know, all my technical issues on my side of my internet. Yeah. But, uh, Heck I yeah really I'd love to have you back. And, uh, just let me know what show you want to, what show you want to come to and uh, i would love to have you as my guest right on brother i may try to make that red rocks that'd be cool man <laughs> that'd be cool it's gonna be a cool one cool brother well i'll hit you up my friend thanks man peace Appreciate out you. yes sir Bye.